Chapter 36 In spite of the long distances they'd travelled in the past few days, Tug was surprisingly fresh. Will cantered him slowly to the spot where the Genovesan had lain, watching the campsite. As he approached, he dismounted and moved forward in a crouch. Close to the highest point, he dropped to his belly and crawled forward to see over the ridge, exposing only a few centimetres of his head as he did so. There was no sign of the Genovesan, although he found the spot where he had been easily enough. The grass was pushed down in a large circle, like the nest of some big animal. Will could see clear tracks in the grass leading away from the ridge where the Genovesan had left each evening. He had followed the same path each time, and his trail was obvious to Will's trained eye. He had headed southeast, the same direction the outsider's group had been following. There seemed to be no reason now to think that they might have altered their course. Will considered the situation briefly. The Genovesan was obviously satisfied that they had left after burying Holt. So there was no reason for him to be laying a false trail, and no reason why he might suspect that he was still being followed. But he was no fool, even if his field craft left a lot to be desired. He would probably check his back trail from time to time, at least for the first few hours, and if Will was going to take him alive, he'd have to catch him with his guard down. Accordingly, Will took Tug in a long arc for two kilometres to the east. Then he turned to parallel the assassin's southeasterly course and brought Tug's pace up to a fast canter. It was an efficient pace. They covered ground swiftly, yet Tug's unshod hooves made far less noise on the soft ground than they would have at a full gallop. They rode steadily towards the southeast. As they crossed each ridgeline, Will took the same precautions against being sighted, but there was never any sign of the Genovesan. After an hour and a half, he veered back in to cross the Genovesan's trail. He found it after a few minutes, satisfying himself that the man was continuing on that same course. He rode out to the west this time, then turned so that he was once more paralleling the course. It was mid-afternoon when he caught sight of the Genovesan. He was ambling along, his horse plodding, head down at a walk. Will smiled. The horse was one they must have stolen from a local farm, and it looked in poor condition. It would be no match for Tug's stamina and speed. And now that he was as close as he was, he knew that the last kilometre or so would probably become a race. Will angled Tug back in, heading to intercept the other rider. The man was slumped in his saddle. Obviously, he was nearly as tired as his horse. By now, he would be confident that there was no pursuit. As he drew closer, Will could see that the man's crossbow was now slung over his shoulder. His thoughts would be focused on the campsite somewhere ahead of him, on the hot food and drink that waited him there. Gently, boy, Will whispered to Tug as he leaned forward over his neck, urging him to more speed. The little horse responded. His hoofbeats thudded dully on the ground, but they were muted by the grass and the damp earth underneath, and Will hoped they could get closer before the Genovesan heard them and realised he was in danger. It was a finely balanced equation. If they went faster, they would close the range more quickly, but they would also make a greater noise and increase the risk of discovery. Will resisted the urge to let Tug go all out. The time for that would come. As he rode, he slung the longbow over his shoulder and, letting the reins lie across Tug's neck, reached into his jacket for his two strikers. At first, Tug's movement made it difficult for him to screw the two brass pieces together. He would begin to insert one into the other and a sudden lurch would bring them apart before he had the threaded sections engaged. He paused and concentrated on matching his body movements exactly to Tug's rhythm. Then, remaining loose and fluid in his movements, he tried again and felt the threads engage. 
After the first few careful turns, he turned faster, screwing the two strikers together into one long piece. He hefted it in his right hand, feeling the familiar balance. The strikers were designed to have the same throwing characteristics as his sax knife. But to use them, he'd have to get to within 20 metres, and that could prove to be difficult. He saw that the Genovesan was almost at another ridge. A sixth sense warned Will, and he realised that it would only be natural for the man to cast a last look behind him as he reached the crest. He brought Tug to a sliding halt, slipped out of the saddle, and pulled sideways on the reins as he dropped to the ground. Tug, trained to respond to a wide variety of signals from his rider, reacted instantly. He came to his knees, then rolled over on one side in the grass, lying motionless as Will placed an arm over his neck. They lay unmoving, concealed partly by the grass and partly by their own lack of movement. From a distance, the grey horse and his cloaked rider would resemble nothing more threatening than a large rock surrounded by low bushes. From beneath his cowl, Will saw the Genovesan rein in at the top of the ridge. He heaved a sigh of relief that he had foreseen this moment. The rider turned, easing his stiff muscles up out of his saddle, and cast a quick glance over the land behind him. But it was a cursory glance only. He had done the same thing from time to time over the past four hours. He had seen no sign of pursuit then, and he expected to see no sign of it now. So he surveyed the grassland behind him, without any great care. In truth, the movement was as much designed to ease his stiff back muscles as to search for pursuers. As Holt had so often told Will during his training, 90% of the time, people only see what they expect to see. The Genovesan expected to see empty grassland behind him, and that was what he saw. The irregular, indeterminate green and grey mound off to the west excited no interest. After a minute or two, he turned back to the southeast and rode down from the crest. Will waited. The oldest trick in the book was to appear to ride away, then suddenly return to look once more. But the Genovesan seemed satisfied that the land behind him was empty of any threat, and he didn't reappear. Will tapped Tug on the shoulder and, as the horse rolled upright and came to his feet, he stepped astride him so that they came up together. With the sound of Tug's hoofbeats now screened by the ridge between him and the Genovesan, he took the opportunity to urge the horse into a gallop. When they came over the crest, he would expect to be only a few hundred metres from the other rider. This time, he didn't pause at the crest. It was time to commit. They had been travelling for almost four hours and logic told him they must be close to the Genovesan's goal. They crested the rise at a full gallop and Will gave a small cry of surprise. Tug's ears went up at the sound, but Will hurriedly reassured him. Keep going, he said. The little horse's ears went down again and he maintained his gallop, never missing a beat. Before them, the landscape had changed. The series of undulating ridges now gave way to a long, gradual slope leading down until it opened out into a wide, long valley. Tennyson's camp was visible some three kilometres away. The numbers had grown from the 12 or 15 people who had been with him originally. Now, he estimated, there must be a hundred people gathered there. But Will's more immediate problem was the Genovesan now less than 200 metres ahead of him. He couldn't believe his luck. The assassin hadn't heard the thudding of Tug's hooves on the grass. He continued at a slow walk, his horse plodding heavily. Then Will saw the man's head jerk up and turn towards them as, inevitably, he heard them. Will was close enough to hear his sudden shout of surprise and saw him put his heels into his horse's ribs rousting it to a lumbering canter, then a weary gallop. It was a tactical mistake, Will thought. 
the shock of seeing him had startled the man into an error. Armed with a crossbow, he would have been better to dismount and face his onrushing pursuer. But then, he wasn't aware that Will needed to take him alive. Perhaps he wasn't ready to face the ranger's phenomenal accuracy and speed once more. He must be aware that only luck had saved him in their previous encounter. Will saw the pale oval of the Genovese's face as he glanced over his shoulder. Tug was closing the range rapidly now, and the man was kicking desperately with his heels to spur his own horse on. But the lumbering farm horse never had a chance to outrun the fleet-footed ranger horse, and Tug was gaining with each stride. The Genovese struggled now to unsling his crossbow. As he saw what the man was doing, Will shoved the joined strikers through his belt and unslung his own longbow. The Genovese's hand went to his quiver, selecting a bolt and placing it in the groove of the crossbow. Will's throat constricted and his mouth went dry as he realised he was about to face one of the man's deadly poisoned bolts. Under normal circumstances, he would have shot first. All the advantages were on his side. The other man had to twist in the saddle to get off a shot, while Will could shoot straight over Tug's ears. At this distance, he could pick him off easily. But he needed the man alive. The Genovesean had finally managed to load the bolt. He turned awkwardly, fighting against the jolting, uneven gait of his horse to bring the crossbow to bear. He was twisting around to his right, so Will guided Tug with his knees, veering him to the left, forcing the Genovesean to twist further, making it more difficult for him to take aim. The Genovesean realised what he was doing and swung suddenly the other way, twisting round to his own left for a clearer shot. But as soon as he did, Will zigzagged again, taking Tug back to the right. The manoeuvre was successful. The Genovesean found that his target was again out of sight and Tug had closed the range by another 20 metres in the process. The Genovesean twisted right again. This time, Will kept galloping steadily, without zigzagging. By now he had an arrow knocked and rode with the reins dropped on Tug's neck, guiding the horse with knee signals. He couldn't risk killing the Genovesean, but his quarry didn't know that. The assassin would get one chance for a shot. There wouldn't be time for him to reload, even if he could manage the task on horseback. When he came to shoot, Will planned to spoil his aim. He was confident that he could loose several arrows in rapid succession, putting them close enough to the Genovese's head to make him flinch. He remembered the duel with the man's compatriot. These men were primarily assassins, used to shooting from cover at a helpless target, someone who was unaware of their presence. They weren't used to open combat, facing an enemy who shot back, and who shot with deadly accuracy. He was close now. Tug's gait was smooth and controlled, unlike the farm horse, who was clumsy and tired, and had the Genovese bouncing unevenly in the saddle. Here it came. The crossbow levelled, and he saw the Genovese's hand begin to tighten round the trigger lever. Will's hands moved in a blur, drawing, releasing and flicking a new arrow out of the quiver and onto the string in such rapid succession that he had three arrows in the air in the seconds before the Genovese released. As his hand tightened on the crossbow's trigger, the assassin suddenly became aware of the danger. Something hissed viciously past his head, seemingly only a few centimetres away and he was aware that two more shots were on the way, a fraction of a second behind the first. It would have taken far more steady nerves than he possessed to hold a cool, deliberate aim, even if he weren't being jolted and jounced by the galloping horse. He ducked, shouting an involuntary curse, and his hand spasmed, jerking hard on the trigger lever and sending the bolt arcing high into the air so that it fell harmlessly into the long grass nearly 100 metres away. The danger was past. Will tossed the longbow aside. 
There was no time to re-sling it, and he could recover it later. He drew the strikers from his belt and urged Tug to one last burst of speed. The assassin, seeing him only 40 metres away, drummed frantically with his heels in his horse's ribs. The exhausted animal had slowed to a trot while his rider had been preoccupied, and now he needed speed again. The horse responded as much as it could, but Tug was eating up the distance between them now. Too late, the assassin began to reach for one of the many daggers he carried. But Will's right arm went up and then came forward in a smooth, powerful throw. The strikers glinted in the sunlight as they spun end over end. For a second, the assassin didn't see them, didn't register the danger. Then he saw the spinning metal and ducked low over his horse's neck. The man had reflexes like a cat, Will thought. The strikers spun harmlessly over his head and disappeared into the long grass. Will cursed. He'd never find them again. He dragged his sacks from its scabbard. Go get him, Tug, he said, and felt the response from his horse as he accelerated once more, now moving as fast as Will had ever felt him move. He saw a glint of steel in the Genovese's hand, recognised it as one of the long-bladed daggers the assassin carried. He held the sacks ready and drove Tug forward. The Genovese started to turn his horse to meet the charge, but he was too late. He struck once, aiming for Tug, but Will leaned forward over his horse's neck and deflected the thin blade with his sacks. Then Tug's shoulder smashed at full speed into the exhausted, off-balance farm horse and sent him crashing over so that he hit the ground on his side and slid for several metres along the slick surface of the grass. The violent movement trapped the Genovese's right leg under the horse's body. The horse's hooves flailed weakly in the air, but it made no attempt to rise. It was finished. Instantly, Will was out of the saddle. He ran towards the trapped assassin. The Genovese had lost his dagger in the collision and was scrabbling frantically under his purple cloak to draw another. Without a second's hesitation, Will stepped in and slammed the heavy, brass-shod hilt of his sacks into the side of the man's head. Then, without waiting to see if the first blow had been successful, he repeated the action, a little harder. The man's eyes rolled up in his head. He let out a weak groan and fell back, his right leg still trapped under the fallen horse. Will stepped back to regain his breath. The second strike had probably been unnecessary, he realised, but he had enjoyed it. So much for you, he said to the still form, and the horse he rode in on.